Uh, good morning. Uh, happy Easter. Resurrection, I should say. In, um, in Luke 5, I know that that's not a resurrection passage, and this, the text for an Easter sermon is pretty much picked for me, you know, for every year. Uh, but in, in Luke 5, verse 26, Jesus does perform a miracle. He heals a man uh, who could not walk. People uh, saw it happen, and they were amazed. And the crowds, after witnessing that healing, they said, we have seen strange things today. They, having seen Jesus and the way Jesus works, they said, we have seen strange things today. And people have been saying that about Christ and his people ever since. Um, and the Bible, the Bible calls Christians, actually, a peculiar people. And we're certainly... Um, we're certain, excuse me, that there are strange uh, things still to be seen in, in church history. Today on Resurrection Sunday, uh, known also as Easter, I want to share with you some of the, really one of the most unusual things that's ever happened on our planet or off it, something that we are still seeing the results of today. Um, before that, I'd like, to, I'd like to pray, though, and we'll get into today's sermon. Jesus, we thank you for uh, the blessing of your son, well, of you, Jesus, you are the son. We thank you for yourself, and we can thank you for no greater thing. Uh, we thank you for resurrection. We thank you that you died so that you could raise again. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins, and I thank you for each person here uh, that you have blessed by raising from the dead. Uh, I thank you for that, and I ask you to bless our time today. Let my words be clear and give us ears to hear what your spirit has to say to the church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, there, is, there is something unusual, as I mentioned. There's something unusual happening today, not just here, uh, but actually it, it's a global phenomenon that's happening today. And it's one that many people would, would scoff at and are scoffing at, probably. And it's a, it's a rather strange occurrence that cannot be explained by biology or, or, or physics. It's more of a metaphysical thing. And despite how extraordinary or abnormal this thing is, it's actually something that happens every single Sunday. Today, like every Sunday for the past 2,000 years or so, uh, there are a few billion people worshiping Jesus of Nazareth as God. Of course, the numbers were smaller 2,000 years ago, but today there are a few billion, a few billion people worshiping Jesus of Nazareth as God. That's pretty crazy to think about. Um, that we're a part of that number. That's pretty cool. Uh, and, but it's not, it's not like it's a common thing for men to worship other men as if they were God. It's true that there have been crazy people throughout history that have demanded to be worshipped as God, dictators and kings from history, but it's not really common for those, people to be con for those kinds of people to have followers that continue to worship them 2,000 years after they die. That's, that's not really common. I don't think that's happening very often. And I know that a lot of you guys... Um, I know, and a lot of you that have grown up in church since uh, you were little kids like me, and, uh, and you celebrate Easter every year uh, dutifully, and you do believe, as I do, and as those few billion people do, that Jesus is God, and you're here to worship him. And that's great. Uh, and it's possible, I'm, I'm sure, that some of you uh, weren't raised in church, didn't have the, the church background that some of us benefited from, and you had to come to the conclusion that Jesus was God through much soul-searching and arguing uh, with uh, yourself about the history and the philosophy of the whole thing, and in the end, Jesus won, and here you are, and you're with the rest of us worshiping Jesus as God. Uh, and it was a fight worth fighting, for sure, a war worth waging. Others of you believe that Jesus is God, uh, maybe just because I told you so, and I want to thank you for accepting me as your cult leader, and <laughs> there will be Kool-Aid in the back after service. Others, <laughs> and we need, we need to work on that. Um, others, others of you, of course, don't, don't believe a thing, or at least uh, don't believe what we teach here, the, the, uh, strange, abnormal, extraordinary belief that Jesus Christ, who is a man, is also God himself. Uh, and you're only here because a family member made you come because it's Easter. And you don't have to feel alone in that because we're usually not this crowded. So I'm sure there's, there's more company you could seek out and, and find more like you. But um, they, did, they did bring you because they love you and you should thank them no matter how annoying that was to, to get you here this morning. All the people I just mentioned, those who had a pretty good idea of the resurrection since preschool, uh, those who came to faith later in life and those of you who are dragged against your will to church today, welcome. 
Uh, but I want to I want to talk to each of you, and I'd like what I'd like to do first uh, is have you notice how ridiculous it is what we're doing today. I I know this is a bit backwards, and I'm supposed to convince you of of faith and encourage you to believe the impossible, and I plan on doing just that. Um, but first, I've you've got to see how impossible resurrection is apart from a supernatural act of God. Yes, I want to make skeptics of all of you, <laughs> just so we're on the same page. We've got to start on the same page. Um, I'm not going to undermine anyone's faith today, but I do want you to realize that your faith is based on something that is rather peculiar and spectacular, and it's something that we cannot take for granted. Uh, you see, today... A few billion people worshiping a Jewish man named Jesus as God and Savior, the creator of universe. Um, they're doing that not, as some of the more ignorant would suggest, because he was a really nice guy. That's not why Christianity exists. Jesus was nice to people. He was nice. You can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the kind of uh, selected biographies of Jesus that we have. Um, and he, he's nice. But Christianity is not based on his niceness. Uh, Jesus was a great teacher, the best teacher, I would say. But Christianity, believe it or not, is not founded primarily on the moral teachings of Jesus. They're important, absolutely, but we don't have Christianity because there was once upon a time a good teacher. Jesus fed the poor, he healed the sick, but Christianity is not based on social justice. Jesus was a great miracle worker, he did the miraculous, he did amazing things that are impossible uh, apart from the divine working of those miracles, but our faith is not founded on miracles, plural. It's founded on one miracle, which is the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. So that distinguishing feature, the distinguishing feature of our faith is the faith that Jesus, who died, is not dead, and that's ridiculous. It has to be. Uh, it has to be supernatural, not natural. It has to be super normal, not just normal. It's not every day that someone rises from the dead. So it's okay to take that isolated piece of information. Jesus was dead, and then now he's not anymore, and kind of raise an eyebrow. People don't really do that. Even Thomas. Thomas is a guy who followed Jesus around for three years, was actually sent by Jesus while he was still alive, while Jesus was still alive, to go preach the gospel and heal people and cast out demons. He was, you know, a, a believer, you could say. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and when, um, when, well, he had heard Jesus, actually. He had even heard Jesus say, I'm going to die, then three days later, I'm going to come back. Jesus had told his disciples that. And then when the other disciples told Thomas, we've seen Jesus, he's alive. Again, he died, yeah, we all saw him die, but now he's alive again. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe that. He wouldn't believe that Jesus was alive until he saw him, because Thomas was of the rather well-founded opinion that people don't rise from the dead. That's Based on evidence, I would say. People have never seen it happen before. He said people don't do that, and he's right. It's very unusual. That's kind of the point. Our faith is extremely unusual. The whole Easter thing is very strange. And one, one thing that makes Christianity so strange and what makes resurrection so strange is that to be raised from the dead, you actually have to die. Makes sense. It's very strange that there are a few billion people worshiping a man who died. You know, I mean, if Jesus had never died and he was still living, you know, and walking around, it's like, well, he's the oldest man in the world. He deserves respect, at least, you know, and I doff my hat to you. But no, he died. And not only did he die, but he didn't die on accident. He died on purpose. In John 12, if you have a Bible and you like following along, you could turn there, but I won't be there for very long. So I warn you have fair warning. After that, we'll be in Mark 8. So either one you want to go to. In John 12, 27, Jesus says, for this purpose, I have come into the world. Um, 27, excuse me, I got that whole reference wrong. Um, Jesus died, Jesus' death was the plan the whole time, and he let the disciples know it. In Mark 8, this is where I was going after, Mark 8, 31, it says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. That's Mark 8, 31. He spoke it openly. He taught people that, yes, it's going to be rough for me. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And then after three days, I'm not going to be dead anymore. But even, even when Jesus mentioned it, it wasn't the first time this thing, kind of thing was mentioned. He wasn't really breaking any new ground. 700 years before Jesus 
uh, of Nazareth was even born. 700 years before that, there was a prophet named Isaiah who prophesied that the Jewish Messiah would suffer for us. Uh, in fact, the book of Isaiah, which is a, a long book in the Old Testament, it's, it's been called by some as the fifth gospel. You know, we've got four in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They say Isaiah could be a fifth one in the Old Testament because it mentions Jesus' virgin birth. It mentions the ministry in Galilee. It mentions that he would heal people. It mentions how he would preach the gospel to the poor, how he would die with common criminals, how he would be buried in a rich man's tomb before coming back to life. All of that said in Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was even born. But in Isaiah 53, it prophesied that the Jewish Messiah would die, and it gives the reason why. And it says in, in Isaiah 53, verse 4, he was wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And in verse 8 of the same chapter, it says he was cut off from the land of the living. Prophesying, and he, he died. He died. This Jewish Messiah, this, this God-man that we're to worship, he died. And we Christians believe that our God died, which is another pretty weird thing. You're not going to find that in any other religion, let me tell you. Uh, in fact, other religions don't even believe that about our religion. Uh, <laughs> the Muslims who do not believe, do not worship Jesus by any means, they can't stand the idea that Jesus really died. And they, they do not teach that. Uh, but he did. Jesus was dead. He was killed by a professional uh, government-paid executioner. Uh, one or two skeptics throughout history have come up with the idea that, the proposition that Jesus wasn't really dead, but you can't really live without a heart. And if you read the Gospels, you realize that there was a Roman executioner who burst his heart with a spear when he was on the cross. And you just don't live without one of those. You don't have a backup. You know, you don't have a spare heart. Once it pops, you're, you're done. You're dead. Islam and Christian science. Christian science is the biggest misnomer ever because they're not Christian. They don't have science. But Christian science and Islam both teach that Jesus only passed out. That he took a nap, basically. That's not what the cross is for. Uh, the electric chair was not invented for sitting and watching TV and just getting excited at the, <laughs> the good parts, you know? It has a purpose, as one purpose. It has one purpose, and it's for killing people. The cross was for killing people, and the Romans were very good at using it for its intended purpose. You don't survive it, especially without a heart. You don't have a chance. So we believe that Jesus died. Uh, history records that for us. We believe that he died, that he was dead, and that he got that way on purpose. And that's actually the easy part to believe, though. When you look at the jealousy of the Pharisees who hated Jesus, the fickleness of the Jewish crowds that cried crucify him, the cruelty of the Romans, and the prophecies leading up to it, it's actually pretty easy to add it all up and end up with a dead Jesus. That's the easy part. The gospel records a dead Jesus being buried in a well-known tomb that a rich guy donated. Um, the tomb was sealed, which means it was if anyone dared to tamper with that tomb, they would be killed um, it was a, a government order, you know, on the tomb. The uh, professional soldiers guarded the tomb so no one could come and do anything with it. I think a dead guy's pretty safe in there. That's, that's the simple part. Let's leave him there for a second, okay? Saturday, the body of Jesus was in the tomb, okay? Let's just, just pause there for it. I think we can probably all agree that Jesus actually died. Uh, none, of, none of you have shaken hands with him. Um, you know, he's... We believe Jesus died. The Bible records this. History records this. Common sense dictates it. Men die. And the cross was a killing machine that, that worked very effectively. But then we've got some really weird stuff happening after the death of Jesus. Really weird stuff. For example, people start behaving rather strangely. Now, Jesus had a couple brothers uh, who didn't really think much of him, actually. It's hard to imagine Jesus being the black sheep of the family, but he kind of was. Uh, there's a place in the Bible where it really seems that they actually make fun of him. Um, they didn't believe he was anything special. But then not too long after Jesus dies, two of his brothers, James and Jude, start publicly worshiping their dead brother as God. That's weird. That's a little... Anyone who has brothers uh, could see the improbability of this happening on its own. I have two brothers. I have two brothers. Okay, Jesus had brothers. I have two brothers. Neither of my brothers would be willing to attest to my sinlessness or my deity. Believe it or not. And I do the same for them. If anyone, uh, if anyone knows that I'm a rotten sinner, I'd say it would be the people that, you know, saw me growing up and my brothers. But Jesus' brothers who had nothing to do with him when he was being nice to people and healing people and performing mir miracles, they just, you know, kept him at arm's length. 
After he dies, they start worshiping him as God and telling other people to do the same and telling them that he's not dead anymore. That's weird. They say this and they keep saying it until people kill them just to shut them up. That's strange. And then you've got, the, you've got this handful of guys who have been following Jesus around for a few years, and they were pansies. Okay, you have these, these 12 men, the disciples of Jesus. When Jesus got arrested, they ran away. Um, when people ask Peter, do you know Jesus? He cusses them out. Okay, he yelled at a junior high girl for suggesting that he was from the same town as Jesus. And he yells at her. After Jesus died... These 12 guys spend their time hiding in a room, hoping no one would come and ask them questions, and with the door locked, okay, bold, real, you know, role models there. That didn't last. Not long after, not long after they see Jesus' body dead on the cross and buried, not long after that, they're telling people that Jesus is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead the Sunday after the crucifixion. They're so set, suddenly, for some reason, on this idea that they all, except John, die martyrs' deaths. They die for their testimony. They say it's true, and they'll, they die with that word on their lips. They live the rest of their lives preaching that Jesus of Nazareth isn't dead, that he's alive, and that he is the Jewish Messiah, and that they had seen, heard, and touched him after he rose from the dead and had seen him ascend into heaven. It's a little weird, guys. It's a little strange. Then you've got Paul. And Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Paul was pretty much the Osama bin Laden of the Jews. Okay, he was a terrorist, literally. He was a terrorist who thought it was his life's call to round up anyone who called themselves a Christian and put them in prison. Kids, women, fam whole families, you know. He was fine watching uh, the first martyr, Stephen, get killed to death. Uh, killed to death. Yeah, that's the way it works. He is killed. He was stoned to death. They threw rocks at this guy until he, until he died. And Paul was there just taking people's jackets. And he was, he was cool with that. Okay, on his way to persecute people, he has a, a change of heart, you might say, um, and he changes. He changes his mind. People don't like that, don't just change their mind. But Paul did and suffered serious consequences for his decision, being beaten, stoned, imprisoned, and eventually beheaded. That's different. During these men's lifetimes, in that first century AD, the number of believers went from a handful of scared men to close to a million in their lifetimes, close to a million Christians. All for the dead guy? Really? No, not really. Obviously, there's something missing here because people don't behave this way for their dead friend. Brothers don't start worshiping their dead brother as God. That doesn't just happen on its own. There's something missing here. People don't make these kinds of changes for a dead guy. If these men who had seen Jesus and John was standing right there when the Roman guard burst his heart, John was standing underneath the cross. He saw him dead. If they wanted to make up a religion and become powerful, they really should have done a better job. Uh, if they wanted to make this stuff up, they, at least they could have made themselves look like heroes, which isn't the case. If I lie, I usually lie for my own benefit. Now you know. It's my time to confess. If I lie, I usually lie for my own benefit. People lie to get stuff. Crucifixion and torture is usually not the thing they lie to get. That makes sense. People don't walk away from fame and a good career the way Paul did just to get beat up in every town you walk into. Not for a dead guy. There's got to be a missing piece. And the most logical conclusion, it is logical, is that the missing piece is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It makes sense. Dead people don't gain followings like this. You don't see a lot of political rallies for George McGovern. And if you're like, who's that? That's the point. That's the whole point. I shouldn't know who that is either. Right? He is dead, by the way. Uh, he's dead, and once it's over, it's over. He's not going to run for any political office. You know, if a guy's dead, you, you can pay tribute. You can mourn the loss, but you don't campaign for him anymore. You know? Like, man. I, I mean, a lot of people have been voting for Reagan anyway, but I don't know. I see bumper, but he, he's dead. He's not, it's not going not gonna to work, guys. These guys campaigned for a dead guy who wasn't dead. A man who died, I should say. And the question has to be why. And the answer has to be because Jesus isn't dead. That has to be it. See, the strange thing, there's, there's a really strange thing about Jesus' tomb. Uh, people are fairly certain that they have found the tomb where Christ was buried. The Bible actually gives some details about the location. And the tomb that most people are set on, like, yeah, that's probably it. They probably use that um, for, to bury Christ in. The location works and everything. But the real 
The real strange thing about that tomb and the real bit of evidence for that tomb being the one Jesus was buried in is this. It's empty. There's no one in it. There's no bones. It's useless as a tomb. (laughs) There's no one in there. You know, people only tried to go decorate the tomb once, and that was on Easter morning. And after that, no one really bothered. You know, and this is because Jesus, who is God, rose from the dead. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only explanation for the strange events, the strange courage that appeared in the disciples, and this strange thing called the church that's been functioning for 2,000 years. You don't go from coward to martyr overnight. It just doesn't happen without something happening. You don't have people like Thomas who say, I won't believe until I see him change until they've actually seen him, which he did. You don't have people like Paul who kills Christians religiously become a Christian, one of the people that he was killing, without some sort of confrontation like meeting the resurrected Lord. You don't end up with hundreds and thousands of people being brutally murdered because they said they saw something that they didn't really see. People do die for lies. That happens. But they believe them. And the disciples saw Jesus die. They couldn't have come to the conclusion that he was alive without some sort of significant evidence, and they got it. They had the evidence, the evidence of the empty tomb and the living Jesus. That was their evidence. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, excellent chapter, probably the best chapter on, best theological treatise on res- resurrection in, in the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13. And, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul says people saw him. In fact, 500 people saw him at the same time. So it wasn't, it wasn't some private sort of hallucination. Uh, most of these people, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, they're still alive when he's writing the letter. So he says, if you don't believe me, you can just go ask him. They saw him. There's all these people. Most, you know, a few of them have, have died. They were older, but most of these guys are still alive. You can go and talk to them about seeing Jesus. Our, our entire world, the way we function in our world is based on eyewitness accounts. You read the newspaper about events that you didn't see. And you can be skeptical about the newspaper, but you usually can figure out what events actually happened. Um, And you believe them because someone else did see it, and they wrote about it, and you believe it. That's the Bible. These other people saw Jesus raised from the dead, and they wrote about it as an eyewitness account. And because they saw evidence of a man resurrected from the dead, everything changes. Everything changes. Their lives change. Their religion changed. Uh, They change the way they do everything. And this is actually why resurrection matters so much to us Christians. The resurrection wasn't just a cool trick. It was a game changer. It changed everything. Resurrection changes every aspect of a person's life. Now, I said in the sunrise service this morning that resurrection is the hook on which everything hangs, and that is true. If there is no resurrection, then this whole Christianity thing is just a joke, and it's, it's a waste of time. It's not just a good use of time. It's a waste of time if the resurrection didn't exist. But because the resurrection did, Everything changes. Every detail of a person's life changes. Uh, The book of 1 Corinthians, which I just I just mentioned, uh, the chapter 15. It's considered the letter of to the to Corinth by Paul is considered by virtually all scholars to be one of the first letters Paul wrote. Uh, One of the first ones. He he wrote it when those first generation eyewitnesses were still alive. People who had seen Jesus were still living. It wasn't separated, you know, a few generations afterwards. But the church he was writing to was really, really messed up, really messed up. You know, people say, I wish I could go back and have things the way they were in the early church. No, you do not. (laughs) Not the way it was in Corinth. Not the way it was in Corinth. Not in Corinth. There were sinners back then, too, interestingly enough. Yeah, you never, never guessed. The church in Corinth was off its rocker. There were people overeating and getting drunk at communion. Mm. If that's not uh, an indication of an alcohol problem, I'm not sure what is getting drunk during communion. Uh, There were people in church suing each other to make a quick buck. He's like, that guy sits in the pew behind me and he drops a lot in that offering plate. I tripped, you know, and they had like that American sue everybody culture kind of thing. And they were suing each other in the secular courts, the other people in church, bad, bad move, not a healthy church. Uh, There was a guy who was having an affair with his stepmom and no one in church was speaking out against it. They thought we're just so welcoming, we're so relevant. We just, well, anyone can come to church, you know? It's fine. There were problems. There were serious problems in Corinth. And Paul writes a letter to sort these problems out. He sorts it out. And he closes the letter with his knockout punch, which is in chapter 15, and that is the gospel. 
And the reason why this church was so out of whack was that they had a, a fundamental misunderstanding of what the resurrection meant. And this is where I, you know, I said the resurrection changes everything, every detail, the way we behave, the way we live. And because they didn't understand a resurrection, the way they lived was <clears throat> no good. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Paul says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, for whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Paul gives his evidence for the resurrection. But why? Why is he telling a church all of these things? He's, not tell he's telling believers. These are people that go to church every Sunday. And he's telling them this is the resurrection. This is why it's so important. You know, they, they probably know all this stuff, but they weren't getting it. Paul shares the gospel with believers because the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, doesn't just impress people. It changes people. And the church in Corinth was desperately in need of change. You see, the resurrection is awesome. The resurrection is awesome because through it, we have hope of eternal life. But do not, mistaken, do not be mistaken into thinking that eternal life begins after you die. That's the way we usually think about it. It's like, oh, we die and then eternal life begins. 1 John 5, 13 says, you have eternal life. That's right now. You have eternal life. Eternal life begins right now. But you also need to be careful not to think that eternal life just means living forever. If people are living forever like they're living now, I'm not sure that's a good idea to let people live forever. Uh, <laughs> eternal, eternal life, biblically, is a much, has a much broader definition. John 13, verse 3 says this, and it's said in a prayer to God. It says, eternal life is this, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life, which has been granted to us because of resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead, never to die again. He has eternal life and he offers it to people. Eternal life, rather than only being a large quantity of life, living a long time, it is a higher quality of life that is available to people today. It's a life that is lived with the knowledge of God. And it is a life that not only believes that Jesus is alive, is alive but that knows the living savior, savior personally. That's eternal life. Eternal life is to know the one true God. That's the high quality of life that we are offered now because Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection is important because it gives hope for the next life and shows us, and shows us how to live this one. It applies to both. Without the resurrection, Paul says we are still in our sins, meaning it's hopeless. But with the resurrection, we are freed from the power of sin. With the resurrection, we have new life. We have peace with God. We have hope of eternal life after this one. And we have power over sin and even death. Death, death is our enemy. We get that. We don't want to die. You know, no one wants to die and then we do anyway. And, but with, with resurrection as a reality, we can know that death doesn't win. In 1 Corinthians 15, again, it says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? You lose. You lose. Life wins. Death loses. When you ask most people what happens after they die, they say they simply don't know. I don't know what happens after they die. I could guess, but I don't know. And if you ask them why, they'll tell you it's because they simply don't have enough information with which to draw a conclusion. You know, hey, well, no one's come back and told me, right? Wrong. Wrong. Someone has. Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth came back from the dead, and he's told us what we have to look forward to. After this life is eternity. We are assured by Jesus, the only guy, to come back after death, never to die again. That death in this life is not, not over. It's not the end. Jesus talks about the afterlife, what we would call the afterlife, more than anyone else in Scripture. He talks about what's after this. As the only guy who knows, he mentions this. But in speaking of the afterlife, do you know what he talks about most? More than anything else, Jesus talks about hell. Jesus talks about hell more than anyone else in the whole Bible. What a downer. What was he thinking, you know? He's supposed to be campaigning for his new religion he's starting. Nope. 
The only guy who would actually know from firsthand experience what exists after the grave says that there is judgment. And we are told that every living soul will be resurrected, just like Jesus was, and will be judged in one of two ways. There's two roads there, two ways to be judged. Everyone will be judged. The first way to be judged is to be judged by your own life, and the second is to be judged by the life of Christ. Those are your two options. Jesus himself is the judge. He can say, I can judge you or I can be judged for you. Those are the two options. You, we can judge you for your sin or we can judge, you, we can judge me for sin. That's what he's saying. You know, Jesus was judged for sin. You can accept that or be judged yourself. That's what we have to look forward to after this life. It's sort of a test, but the teacher is a good teacher and doesn't give pop quizzes. You have, your, you have this life in which to answer correctly. And as with good teachers and good tests, the test is given so that you can go to the next grade. That's the point. Uh, it's not a pop quiz. In fact, you can't make the decision then. You kind of have to make it now. That's your only option. Uh, you get to choose the way you will be judged then. You get to choose right now. You can start living eternal life now which is a quality of life, not just a quantity of life, which is a life that begins now. You don't have to wait till you die, and it is a life in which you know God personally. Um, and you can get to know the resurrected Jesus right now, and you can begin right now to live eternal life as a friend of Jesus. You will live forever either as a friend of Jesus or a foe of Jesus. You know, I launched a paperclip out there. I got another one. We work and we pray for, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we know that as long as we live on this earth, this sinful world, it's still going to kind of be a mess. Uh, but the resurrection of Christ shows us that there, there is another life, and I like that a whole lot. The world I want is one with Jesus. If you have that desire, you can know that it is from Jesus. He's given you that that pleasure, that desire in wanting him. He's given you that hope. If your hope is in this world, if you really think it's going to get better, you will be disappointed. People will fail you, and you will fail people. Sin will have its effects on you, and you will die in sin. Then after that, you'll continue to live in sin and the consequences of sin and being punished for sin forever or you realize that this life really isn't anything like the heaven you wish it would be. The world you have been born into is nothing like heaven, so to get into that life, you can't be born into this world. You have to be born again into the next. That's when eternal life begins. If you are born again, then you can have complete confidence that your life is eternal, that new life is yours, that a higher quality of life belongs to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, that's what today's all about, right? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. For the born-again believer, resurrection is personal. It's not something we observe in the third person about Jesus. It is personally something that we experience in the first person today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is something that you can benefit from. It's something that you cannot ignore and a decision that you can put off at your own peril. Most people in this room know Jesus. I know most of the people in this room. If someone were interested in meeting Jesus, you could hit, throw a rock and probably hit someone. They'll say, ow, and then they'll say, do you want to meet Jesus? And then you're set. Well, they'll, they'll lead you there. I'll be up here praying after service with anyone who needs anything. And I would love to, love to talk with you. Um, but you can, you can surely find someone who knows Jesus, and anyone who knows him can introduce him to you. Uh, and it is, it is a resurrection that is personal, and I want it to be personal for each one. I'm going to pray, and we'll close, and you can feel free to stick around as long as you'd like or talk about anything with me or people around you. Pray with me, please. Jesus, you are alive. You are alive and well and living with us and in us. And the same spirit that rose you from the dead has given us newness of life and we rejoice in it. This is the day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. 
I rejoice, God, that you change lives still, like the disciples and, and your brothers, and that you offer the evidences needed to make a, an educated decision in faith. You give us those things, and we rejoice in that. God, I thank you for these people. I pray that if anyone doesn't know you, that you would introduce yourself to them and put it on their, put people around them to speak the words they need to hear, that that decision would be made. God, I ask you to bless your church today. I pray that today we would be living in your new life, that we would be living according to the new life that Christ lives. We want to be like you. We want to live in you. We want to live for you, and we look forward to seeing you with our eyes. Our Redeemer lives, and in our flesh we will see God. Bless us, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.